In today's episode, you will get to hear from Frank Kane, who is a data scientist and has built a massive student audience in the fields of big data and machine learning. You also hear how he has built his business to over $2 million in revenue, how he leverages third-party marketplaces like Udemy, and the strategies he has in place when creating, producing, and publishing a new course. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Online Course Igniter podcast, where you'll hear from successful course creators and how they were able to turn their passion into a thriving online business empire. Hey, everyone. Thank you for checking out the podcast today. We have Frank Kane from Sundog Education. How's it going today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. It's I'm happy to have you on the podcast. And uh, today we're just going to hear about how you got started with online courses. And I know you've had some pretty major success. And I'm super happy to hear about uh, how you got started and what you've been up to lately. So uh, let's just hear a little bit of a story of what got you into online courses in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a happy accident, to be honest. Um, So back in 2012, I quit my day job, so to speak, at Amazon.com in Seattle because we just couldn't take the weather in Seattle anymore. So we picked up and moved to Florida. Uh, So, you know, I was in this point where I'm like, well, maybe I should try self-employment, see how that goes. Um, And for a while, I was just doing like contract gigs, you know, trading my time for money doing like software engineering work. And uh, that that got old real fast, right? Uh, So one day, um, I ended up doing a contract gig for a company in uh, New York called General Assembly, where I was doing some curriculum development for them. Uh, related to recommender systems and uh, machine learning and data science, which is what I did at Amazon. And uh, after doing that, I got a call out of the blue from Udemy uh, a few months later. And they're like, hey, um, mind you, this is back in like 2014, 2015. Uh, They're like, hey, we need someone to teach uh, big data and data science on our platform. We uh, we don't have enough instructors for that. You want to give it a try? I'm like, well, what do I have to lose, right? How hard can it be? (laughs) Little did I know. Um, It's hard. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it got started. So, um, you know, in 2015, I think it was, I published my very first course on Hadoop. And, uh, you know, initially it was a flop, to be honest. You know, the first month made like 200 bucks or something like that. Um, but nevertheless, I persisted. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of like one of the big lessons is just to not give up too soon. And, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but, you know, building upon that first course, you know, I built a second course that I could market to from the students in that first course. And, Today, I have about 12 courses out there, and uh, they've reached to over 500,000 enrollments on Udemy alone, and even more if you count other platforms out there. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, I- I've seen you, your success over the years. You know, 2014, 2015 was still kind of the early days of the, the platform. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you've been on that platform for quite a, a while, and uh, definitely one of the top instructors. So going back to that first course, uh, you... Yeah, had you ever made anything like that before, or was this your first time doing videos and audio and and those kinds of things? Yeah, it was really my first time doing that stuff. Um, you know, I did some training, you know, in person at Amazon.com once in a while for like training new employees and things like that. But uh, that was the first time I had to be an AV guy. <laughs> yeah, and it 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 is can be pretty tricky uh, figuring all the technology out and all the different things that you have to do. So so what was it like when you when you were putting up that first course? I mean, uh, you said you launched it and it made a little bit of money, but how were you feeling at that time? Were you like super excited or was it kind of defeating after you made those first sales? Honestly, it was a little bit disappointing. You know, I mean, I kind of went into Udemy looking at uh, the list prices that people were charging as opposed to what they were actually getting, which as you know, can be a pretty big difference. And doing the math saying, oh my gosh, this person has, you know, thousands of students at $100 a pop. I'm going to get rich, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of new people coming to the platform have some of those same uh, misconceptions. You know, you have right. to realize that a lot of these instructors are inflating their student counts with free students. And people never, well, they rarely buy for full list price. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the name of the game is volume. Um, so, you know, over time... You know, I started to realize that if I can just start building on this audience and expanding that audience, you know, even if the amount that I'm getting per student is relatively small, when you have hundreds of thousands of students, it adds up to something significant. Um, so, you know, that, that's a strategy I took. I just tried to like take that initial audience. The first thing I did actually was creating a free course. I'm not sure I'd recommend doing this today, but uh, what I did was I created a short one-hour free course. It was sort of like a general high-level overview of my paid course. And in the bonus lecture of that free course, I pointed it to the paid course that I developed as my first paid course. And um, at the time, that actually worked. It funneled enough you know, new students and new reviews 
into that course for it to uh, finally take off, you know, and get the reviews that Udemy's algorithms want to see and the and the um, conversion rates that Udemy's algorithms want to see to start promoting it. Um, that was a lot easier back then when there was less competition on the platform, obviously. Uh, but that's really how that one got jump started. So, uh, talking to someone who maybe hasn't made a course before and they're considering creating their own online course and they're deciding uh, between Udemy and other platforms and say they, they want to put a course on Udemy, if you don't recommend the free course strategy in the beginning, what would, what would be your recommendation for someone who's brand new, who doesn't have any students or audience on Udemy already? Yeah, the important thing is really to be really careful with your topic selection, right? So I see a lot of people coming onto Udemy as first-time instructors, and they're teaching some topic where there's already a thousand other teachers established in that topic. That is not a recipe for success. Uh, So it doesn't mean that you don't have to teach what you love. You know, it just means you have to maybe refine that down to something a little bit more unique in the marketplace. You know, can you find some, some niche of your topic that you know about or some subset of it that does not have a lot of competition, but is still in, in demand, right? So uh, my advice to new instructors is to go familiarize yourself with the Udemy uh, Insights tool. And that can give you all sorts of great information about the current demand for a topic that you're interested in teaching and also the current competition. It even shows you the top selling courses in that topic. So you can go there and look at them and ask yourself, can I do a better job than this? Uh, can I actually have a shot at being the best course in this topic? And uh, that's, that's the way you become successful. Okay, so say someone goes and they they know how to do something. Let's just use data science for instance. They are a data scientist. They go on Udemy and they see that it is already has a lot of stru- uh, instructors and courses. And you know maybe they're thinking to themselves, you know, I don't know if I could come on this platform. Do you, do you feel like it's already too saturated in some instances. Would you still recommend people to give it a shot or would you direct them maybe to try somewhere else? You know, I, to this day, Udemy is still my major cash cow by and large. So, you know, I'd be very hesitant to point people at any other platform unless they have a topic that resonates more with a different platform. You know, for example, Skillshare is a good place for people teaching art and, you know, creative stuff. Um, but you know, if you're careful enough with topic selection, let's take data science as the example. Like you said, there's a lot of like niche topics within data science. Maybe you know, computer vision, or you know, how to manually mark up images in a test data set, or things like that. Um, these might be very specific technical skills that people are searching for, but there is no course that is specifically about that topic. So, if you can, there are still opportunities to be the first mover on things like that. Uh, another field is uh, certification exams. So there are new certification exams coming out all the time. Uh, these presents new opportunities for people to jump in and produce a quality course to prepare people for those exams. So you really just have to be you know, cognizant of the opportunities that are out there. And they're still there. They're just not as easy to find as they used to be. Yeah, definitely. I think that's some good advice is maybe niching down into the topic a little more. And once you create some niches, it seems like maybe you build up your student base and you can start going after the more general topics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it is harder to get a new course off the ground these days, even for me. Uh, you know, my best sellers are the ones that I released several years ago and just kind of been doubling down on them. So I think it's actually debatable if uh, the right strategy once you do get established is to double down and like maintain your stronghold on that course that did find traction or to expand on that with additional courses. Um, we're at this weird inflection point where there's so many new instructors coming out there on Udemy and other platforms too. Uh, that you know, sometimes the best uh, strategy is more defensive than anything else. Mm, very good. So you put your courses up on there. It's been some years now, and you're seeing you know um, some growth, and you know definitely doing this full time. So what else outside of Udemy have you been doing? Are there other platforms that you're on, or do you have any of your uh, courses on your own platform? Uh, yes, all of the above. <laughs> So uh, in addition to Udemy, um, I'm, I'm kind of grandfathered in because I had published on these other platforms before the Udemy for Business exclusivity stuff kicked in. So you can still find my stuff on places like Skillshare, uh, Pack Publishing, Safari, uh, Manning, they've been good. Um, who am I forgetting? Those are, those are the big ones. Uh, LinkedIn Learning, they have one of my courses too. And I do have my own website as well, sundog-education.com, where I'm selling subscriptions and you know selling one-off courses too. So that's kind of my hedge against everything else. You know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Udemy is a pretty nice basket, but, um, (laughs) you know, it's always good to have some diversity. 
Right, definitely. So you put your courses on your own website. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, are you just putting the same courses that you have on these other platforms on your website or on your own website? Are there different courses? Are they more advanced? How, how would you describe that process? Uh, it's by and large the same content. You know, I do make sure that my own website and Udemy get any updates first. Uh, but it's the same content. The thing that's different is that I offer a subscription plan there, and that's not something you can order. You can offer on uh, Udemy right now, at least not today. Uh, so you know, people can you know sign up for twenty five bucks a month or nineteen dollars a month, whatever the special is this month, and get you know unlimited access to my entire catalog. And you know, if you're going to be really going through all of my courses, that can actually be a better deal than what they'll see on other platforms. Right, definitely. So uh, let's talk about uh, traffic because one of the main problems that course creators have is they go out, they create the course, and whether they put it on Udemy or their own website, the main struggle is getting people to see that course. Mm -hmm. So do you have any tips or recommendations for how you get traffic either to the Udemy platform or to your website? Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to pick which goal you want first, right? You know, do you want to send your traffic to Udemy or to your own website? Um, because, you know, Udemy's algorithms do seem to take conversion rates into account. So the more qualified traffic you can send to your landing page on Udemy, uh, the more Udemy's going to like your course and the more it's going to promote it. You know, and I say like, you know, keep in mind these are algorithms. There are no like, you know, people in a big cabal in a dungeon inside of Udemy <laughs> deciding who and who will not be successful, right? Right. Uh, but you know the algorithms like to see good converting landing pages and good converting courses. So, you know if you're going to send your traffic to Udemy, that's your strategy. You're saying I'm all in with Udemy. I want to like become a top seller. I want to get a tag on Udemy, um, and that's one way to do it. You know, just sending pre quality, pre qualified traffic to Udemy, and that can be from blog posts, from YouTube videos, um, whatever it is, right? But if you want to send it to your own website, um, I mean, you can do that too. And the same strategies generally apply. You know, paid advertising might be a component there if you're going to your own website. Um, I have never been able to get paid advertising to pay off. You know, it's it's never been effective for me. What does work, however, is YouTube. Um, and you know, kind of that's kind of a, a shotgun approach on YouTube. You just have to like put out a bunch of your free uh, preview lectures out there, and some of them won't get any traction, but some will. And I can't really predict which ones take off and which ones don't. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. I have, you know, I have some awesome videos on YouTube that get like five views, and I have one that you know I didn't think was that great that has like three hundred thousand views. Right. And that turns out to be a really great lead magnet for people buying the full course that that's associated with. Okay, cool. So I definitely want to talk more about uh, a YouTube strategy strategy and what people can do on that end. But how would someone who's a new course creator decide whether it's better to go for Udemy and be all in and send all the traffic there versus sending it to their own website? For a new creator that you know really has no existing audience, I think it's going to be a lot easier to get started on Udemy because they're doing a lot of marketing on your behalf, right? So you're just sort of helping that along as opposed to starting from scratch. Um, so initially, that was my strategy when I was starting out. I sent everything to Udemy, and my goal was just to make that conversion rate as good as it could be. Uh, so if you are getting started, I think that's a good way to go. Um, I do not think I'd be able to get any traction on my own website you know, if I did not have that existing audience and that existing mailing list that I had built up. Uh, through my presence on Udemy. Okay. Um, so at what point would would you say to someone that it would be better to go to their own website just after they've been doing Udemy for a while and they've got it converting? Or are there any instances where you might just start with a website and bypass Udemy? I would say that when your sales are plateauing in Udemy, it's time to start thinking about something else, right? So, um, you know, eventually you're, there's a point where you hit market saturation, even within as big of a marketplace as Udemy, where, you know, no matter what you do, <laughs> you know, no matter how hard you try, you know, it's really, really becomes hard to get additional revenue and students out of the platform because you've tapped it out. Um, so if you're lucky enough to get to that point, you know, it's definitely time to like, you know, explore your own platform, you know, try other things that you can try out. And that's, that's how I got that way. Um, but you know, depending on the topic, people might hit that point sooner or later, and for different reasons. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you do think that you've maxed out your potential on Udemy, then it's time to you know turn to your own website and start investing in that. Okay, awesome. So let's let's talk about YouTube. Um, I know you said it was kind of a shotgun approach, just kind of throw some things up there and see what sticks. Um, is there any special strategies or any things that you do specifically for YouTube other than just posting uh, preview videos on there? Or how, how are you directing the traffic from YouTube to your courses? Do you um, do any type of lead magnet and then send them to the course? Or are you just sending them straight from YouTube to your course? 
I set them straight from YouTube. Um, you know, I, I have enough traffic now that I can do cards at the end and all that stuff that you know directs people directly to, to where I want them to go. Um, if you can't do that, then what I did before was just put a link to the course as the first line in the description of the video. Uh, but there are some you know strategies for YouTube. Uh, you know, YouTube tends to like uh, videos that have a title in the form of a question that people might be searching for. Um, so you know, instead of you know some dry lecture title that I might have in Udemy. Uh, it might be a little bit. There might be a little bit more thought from an SEO standpoint as to what that title would be. Like you know, um, learn how to set up, um, you know, whatever it is in fifteen minutes, or you know, tutorial. Words like tutorial and step by step tend to be popular on, U- on YouTube. It seems. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it seems like YouTube is a, a pretty good way to get people in courses. To me, it, it seems the easiest way because. It's like they're already used to watching videos, so the from going to a YouTube video to a video course seems to make a lot of sense in most cases. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, you know I do also do some uh, original content for YouTube as well. So, uh, for example, some of my most popular videos are one where I talk about uh, interview tips for getting through an interview at Amazon or Google, and another one is sort of like how do I get experience in the field of data science or big data. So, you know, these are questions that people are typing in, and I'm thinking about my students. You know, what problems are they trying to solve? Uh, they want to get a job, you know. They want to get through an interview. They want to get experience. So, I'm creating videos that directly answer those questions and posting the, those on YouTube, and then you know, promoting my course at the end of that. And that's that's been pretty effective. Hello, course creators. Are you struggling with marketing and selling your online course? If so, then head over to our free community where successful course creators are ready to help you create, market, and sell your expertise. Go to onlinecourseigniter.com forward slash community now to join. That's onlinecourseigniter.com forward slash community. So it sounds like a lot of your strategy, your marketing strategy is sending the traffic directly to the courses and straight to the course sales. Are you doing any kind of email capture or lead magnets or anything like that on any of your platforms? I do. Um, you know, I'm doing what Udemy allows in that regard. Um, I'm not using like fancy funnels or anything like that. But the first thing people do when they go to one of my courses is I direct them to a course materials page where they can download the, the code for the course and the slides and whatnot. And that way I can keep all that stuff centralized. And while they're there, there's an optional sign up for my mailing list, <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, it's within the bounds of Udemy policy to, to have that as long as it's inobtrusive. Uh, but that's where most of my mailing list signups come up. And, uh, you know, I've I haven't taken a look at the number of subscribers, but it's it's in the thousands. It's pretty substantial. Okay. And then do you ever send out emails f- from that list out to your courses? Is that a strategy that seems to work? Yeah. I mean, honestly, promotional announcements on Udemy are still the most powerful marketing tool I have. Um, but we do send out monthly uh, promotions to our email list as well, as well as, you know, just regular educational content as well. You know, the latest news in the field. Um, you know, what's going on with my courses, you know, what new content have we added, things like that. So it's, uh, it's been helpful. And I actually have a, a social media manager who, you know, manages a lot of that content and the actual mechanics of posting it all for me. So that makes life a lot easier too. <laughs> okay, awesome. So speaking of social media, what social media platforms are you using? Um, are you doing any special marketing or do you send out your links from any of your social media accounts or is it just about building up your brand? Um, both, you know, we, we do have, uh, Facebook groups associated with our courses and those are huge. Um, we have one that has over 50,000 members now, uh, just from students in that course. So that's a, a powerful thing to have, you know, potentially, <laughs> um, we also have Twitter accounts and, uh, LinkedIn and, uh, there's also a Facebook page, but yeah, we do all the, the standard social media stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mostly it's just for, you know, building up trust, um, with our students and our audience. You know, we just post a lot of helpful information there allow students to help each other. We moderate the discussions. Uh, we try not to be too pushy or salesy there, but you know, if there's a new course, I'll tell them about it. <laughs> nice. So whenever, how, how are you getting the people um, from your course into the Facebook group? Would you just mention it in the lectures or is there a special, special way you're getting them to enroll? Yeah, on that same uh, course materials page, there are links to follow us on, you know, whatever it is. And there's a follow-up for that in our... Um, you know, we mentioned it at the end of our promotional announcements. Uh, we mentioned it in our uh, automated message when a student finishes a course. So, you know, it's a way they can keep in touch. And a lot of people just track us down. You know, it's uh, it's weird. Like, uh, I think I get more people that just like search for me online and like connect with me on LinkedIn or whatever they find just by searching on Google or whatever. So, a lot of it 
just kind of comes to me. It's, you know, <laughs> students really want that connection to the instructor. They want to like say that they are somehow connected to a professional in this field. And, you know, that's kind of part of what we're offering. Nice. So how do you handle students? Because I know, you know, being from you to me also, that when you get into the hundreds of thousands of students and you have a Facebook group of 50,000 people, that it can be overwhelming to Mm -hmm. answer questions and take messages and Q&As and those types of things. So how how are you going about actually uh, providing value for the student and being there for everyone? Well, I can't. Um, you know, an individual cannot scale to hundreds of thousands of students. It, it just cannot happen. There aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, and this is a real problem, you know, because part of the Udemy uh, sort of value proposition is that Q&A component, that interaction with the instructor. And when you get to that scale, that's very challenging to maintain. Um, the first line of defense is I do have a teaching assistant. He's a, a former student of mine who took all of my courses. And I reached out to him and said, hey, you want to help out with this? And Fortunately, he said yes, and to this day, he's kind of the first line of defense for all the Q&A on Udemy. Uh, but still, when you get to that scale, there's a lot of students who decide they don't want to go to a TA. They want to go directly to you, <laughs> and they will find you. Like um, yesterday, one of, one student actually, uh, one student tracked down my WhatsApp account. That was a first. Another <laughs> one actually, another one contacted my daughter. Like they couldn't get a hold of me directly, so oh, they wow. actually tracked down my daughter's um, LinkedIn <laughs> account. And like try to get at me through her. So some of them can be pretty pushy. It's yeah. a little strange. <laughs> yeah. But this is the sort of stuff that you deal with when you're at this scale. It's almost like being a celebrity, you know? Like I'm right. actually thinking of like hiring an assistant or an agent or someone to screen all my <laughs> messages. It's uh, <laughs> it's insane. Well, I you know, it, that's the hard part of this situation is you want to help and be there for everyone. But when you get to that that size, it it just becomes so hard. And it's hard finding a good method of knowing that you care for the students and you want to be there for them, but that you can't also be messaging 24 hours a day. It's just not feasible. Yeah, I mean, I think the strategy is to kind of scale out that help as much as you can. So I found that my Facebook group is a good channel for this. You know, if I post a a Facebook live session where I just talk about something helpful for the students, that's going to be me reaching, you know, 50,000 people in that group. Uh, that scales a lot better than one-on-one interaction, right? So mm-hmm. you can still be helpful and, you know, let students see that you want to be helpful um, without, you know, spending an hour with each individual student because that's literally impossible. Right. Okay. So I also know that you've been doing a little more co-instructing type courses where mm-hmm. you might do a course with someone else. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. How's that going and how, how does that work? Yeah, Um you know, that's actually uh, something worth talking about in the context of new instructors getting started. You know, if you can partner with someone, that might be a good way to sort of uh, cheat <laughs> and uh, find a good audience uh, from the from the outset. Um, but yeah, the, the partnerships I've been doing have been going well lately. Um, we've done a couple of uh, courses on AWS certification with Stefan Marek. And that has been wonderful because, you know, he is also a top instructor and has a, a loyal following. So we've kind of been able to cross-pollinate our audiences that way. And we knew from the get-go that we both knew what we were doing, right? You know, there was no issue of trust there to deal with. You know, we knew we both knew that the other person knew how to make courses and be successful on Udemy. So that was a very low-risk uh, partnership to go into. Uh, but it's easy for these, these partnerships to go wrong, right? You know, I mean, there are people out there who are almost predatory, I would say, where, you know, they're just trying to, like, you know, hire people to make courses for them and take all the money. And um, that's that's not how I operate. But, you know, people do need to be careful when they enter into these partnerships. There are some horror stories out there. So do you do any type of contracts or do anything on the legal side to protect yourself or your your courses? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you're talking about that kind of money, it would be crazy not to have an agreement, right? So um, at one point, Udemy had kind of a boilerplate that they offered uh, instructors for putting that together. I'm not sure if it's still available or not, but I kind of based mine off of that. But the important things are you have clear expectations about who's going to do what by when. Uh, who's going to support the course going forward, and of course, most importantly, how the revenue will be split. Um, how are you going to deal with publishing this course on other platforms potentially, and how you split that revenue? Uh, you know, when you're dealing with subscription products, that gets a little bit uh, hairy, right? So, you got to think through this stuff up front. Uh, make sure that you have in the agreement that nobody's going to like use any copyrighted material or anything like that, because you know you don't want to be dealing with a situation where your co-instructor use some copyrighted picture and didn't tell you about it, and then you have a takedown request on your course. So Hmm. little things like that you have to think about. Okay. And so if you're a new student and you, you know, you don't have really an audience and people don't really know about you, how would, I'm sorry, a new instructor, Mm -hmm. how would a new instructor go about finding uh, another co-instructor to work with? 
Well, you know, probably the best way would be to go to one of the conferences like Udemy Live when they're doing that again. <laughs> uh, that's how I actually met the first guy that I partnered with for a co-instructor relationship because it's better to get to know the person personally, uh, you know, establish some trust and kind of, you know, get some confidence that they know what they're talking about, right? Um, so that would be ideal if you can actually like know somebody face to face and, you know, gain that level of trust before entering into that kind of a relationship. And you don't have to be like a fame. You can be a first time instructor and still go to Udemy Live. So, <laughs> you know, that's that's definitely a strategy. Um, I don't know when they're going to start doing that again. Hopefully next year, you know, if all goes well. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, um, you can always reach out. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to find out who the top instructors are in a given topic. You know, I mean, Udemy Insights will tell you that. So if you feel like you have something to offer, you know, some expertise or maybe an ability to create a... Uh, some component of the course that the instructor might be sick of doing himself, like, you know, hands-on exercises and coding exercises or just creating the slides during the research, so reach out. You know, you never know what they might say. Uh, PM the guy and say, hey, I'd like to partner with you and um, see where it goes. Nice. Awesome. So I know another problem that students have is... Uh, piracy on the internet. So, you know, courses that are being taken and put on other websites or put yeah. on YouTube. How are, how, are you, how are you battling that? Oh, man, it is definitely a big problem. Um, so I do a few things. First of all, I do not enable downloads on my videos. I know people can get them through other means, but I don't want to make it any easier than it has to be, right? So that's, that's step number one. I mean, even if students are begging you to enable downloads on your videos, don't do it. If they want to, like, view your content offline, they can use the mobile app to do that if they want to. Uh, so that's the first line of defense. The second is making sure that there's watermarks on all of my content, copyright notices on all of my content. Uh, I don't make the you know raw PPTs of my slides available. I make them available in PDF form, so it's hard to get rid of that uh, watermark. So in the event that it does leak out, you know, someplace where it shouldn't be, at least they'll still you know see my name and see where to come and get my courses legitimately if they so desire. Um, and beyond that, it's just diligence. So you know, once a month we have the unglamorous task of going through all the practice exams on Udemy and our topic and buying them all and making sure nobody stole my questions, for example. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you just have to put some effort into it, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a uh, definitely can be a problem. I found just through the years that I almost don't even pay attention to it anymore because yeah. people are going to do it right and you can't stop it. Um, it's, it's a little ridiculous, but the people I think who care about you and, and, are interested in you are going to pay regardless. So, and the other thing too is, you know, your your loyal students will often tell you when something really egregious is going on, right? So, mm -hmm. if somebody does something like take your your course and re-upload it on the same platform under their own name, odds are you, you'll hear about that from a student. <laughs> so, yeah. they're, they're kind of my uh, eyes and ears on a lot of that stuff. Awesome. So, uh, just real quick, is there any? Um, I just want to hear: is there any? Um, pieces of technology, software, equipment, or anything that you recommend for someone getting into course creation that you really like or you think will help out with creating a course? Boy, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on your budget, of course, right? You know, I think the biggest mistake I made in my first course was being cheap. Uh, there was no need for it. You know, I, I didn't want to risk any money at all. So I actually um, used my cell phone to record the whole thing. Um, I used a ble Blue Yeti mic, which isn't a bad choice, actually, but I, it's just what I had lying around. Uh, and instead of a light, I actually stuck a monitor in front of my face with a white screen on it. So a <laughs> uh, really, really low-budget, low-tech approach. And it worked. You know, it actually looks decent. Um, but I would recommend, if nothing else, buy a decent ring light or something like that if you're going to be on camera at all. Um, good lighting is probably the simplest thing you can do to make your videos look better. And um, from a technology standpoint... Make sure you have a decent microphone. You want to make sure it sounds good. Uh, good microphone placement and the how quiet your environment is often counts more than the mic itself. Um, but, you know, get what you can afford. Um, I'm using a Shure SM7B right now, which I'm in love with. Sounds uh, great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a dynamic microphone. So the, the advantage of that is that you can't actually hear all the construction going on outside of my window because it's not a very <laughs> sensitive mic. Um, which makes life a lot easier. So that's that's one tip too. Uh, for software, I'm just using Camtasia. I've been using that for years. I'm still happy with it. So um, it doesn't have to be complicated, guys. You know, like you can get away with just using a cell phone and a relatively inexpensive mic and inexpensive software, and still get good results. It's your presentation skills and how you teach that's far more important. So, uh, going off of that, what are some other just general tips that you could get give someone starting out, whether it be 
on uh, how to teach or how to present or how to create the course? You know, when I look at other courses, um, the main thing I see is that they're just not engaging. Um, the presenter is talking in a monotone and they are just maybe reading from a script. I can't really tell, but you can tell they're not really excited about what they're teaching, right? Um, so many courses are delivered that way. Uh, so, you know, just make sure that you have good energy, you know, record at a time when you're the most alert, you know, don't do it right after lunch when you have like a sugar crash or whatever it is. Uh, be excited, you know, be, and if you're not teaching something you're excited about, gosh, that's problem number one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the main thing, you know, just make sure that you're an engaging presenter. And that's really what students are looking for. And that's what they're rating at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. I go back and look at my first course and I just, oh, it, it was rough. <laughs> oh, yeah, we all learn. Um, awesome. So where do you see yourself going from here? Um, I mean, you've had some great success on Udemy. You have your courses on all the other platforms. Uh, where do you see taking Sundog Education or uh, any of your other business from this point? Well, this might sound weird, but my goal isn't really to grow anymore. You know, I just want to kind of maintain what I have because I'm happy with it. So, <laughs> um, you know, we're closing in on two million in revenue on Udemy uh, in a month or two, I think. And uh, it's hard to push it farther than that, quite honestly. You know, there are people who make more, but um, I'm making enough to be comfortable. So, like I said earlier, it's kind of more of a defensive play at this point. You know, I want to make sure that the courses that I do have out there are continually getting better, uh, continually remain competitive with the other courses out there. So I'm spending my time just, you know, creating more and more content for the courses I have and keeping them up to date. Uh, so that's really my strategy now and for the foreseeable future. Um, just making sure that I always have one of the best data science and machine learning, learning courses on the market. I have the best uh, Elasticsearch course on the market, whatever it is. Um, and just sort of like defending that position uh, to make sure that what I have at least doesn't go away. So do you believe that it is better to keep refining a course or do you think it's better to keep producing more courses? Um, it, de it depends on whether or not you have a hit or not, right? So, you know, if you have, you know, gotten lucky and found a course that does have traction and is doing well, I think today, at least on Udemy, the best strategy is to double down on that course and defend your position. Uh, because like I said, there's so much competition with other instructors right now, it's very hard for a new course to get off the ground. Uh, so it's often better to build on the success you have uh, you know, sort of double down on that rather than trying to create a whole new success with a new course. Mm -hmm. So you have these courses, and I know you're playing the defensive role now, but just looking out, say, five or 10 years from now, where do you see online education going? And what do you think you might be doing at that point, assuming things just kind of stay the way they are? Yeah, it's it's hard to say. Um Obviously, like online education is going through a big transformation right now, you know, just because of the demand for, uh, you know, learning at home. And we're seeing these platforms just take off in ways that are unbelievable lately. Um, I, I don't know where it's gone ahead, to be honest. You know, I, my personal opinion is that there's going to have to be some sort of correction um, from the flood of new instructors that are coming into the market. I think there's going to be more and more of a demand for curated content, you know, and that's what we see with like the growth of Unity for Business, for example. Uh, where, you know, students are going to be more concerned with how do I know that I'm buying a good course, you know, from someone that you know, actually knows what they're talking about um, and solving that problem for them. Because there's no, there's no shortage of courses on any topic. Uh, the problem is students making sure they're getting a good one. Uh, so, I don't know, I guess that's a long way of saying that I think, you know, platforms that are doing more curation um, are going to be where it's at. And I hope to be a part of that going forward. And that might mean... Ultimately, you know, more um, different forms of education. You know, I think uh, people are going to want more live interactions with instructors in a way that is scalable. Uh, but by and large, it's hard to imagine how it will change fundamentally. You know, I mean, there's only so many ways to teach stuff online. Uh, you know, you can have these interactive exercises that you can do on your, on your screen together with an instructor. You can have video. Um, beyond that, I don't know what innovations five years hold, but uh, I don't see it changing that much. I just see it getting bigger and more curated. So have you done any live events uh, recently since you have been an online instructor? Apart from the occasional Facebook Live, I've been avoiding them. Um, but like in-person events, like one-on-one, -on -one, oh. like in a, in a room with people? <laughs> No, I mean, I get requests for that. They never want to pay for you, though. So <laughs> it's oh, kind of hard to justify, you know, like, I'll fly to Europe and give a talk, you know, for the exposure. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, no thanks. 
Um, I have enough exposure already. Thank you very much. <laughs> have uh, you thought about doing any of your own events? Uh, I haven't really. Um, one thing that I really like about the lifestyle of an online instructor is the freedom that it gives you and the personal freedoms. Mm-hmm. So I try to like avoid situations where I have to be somewhere at a given time to do a specific thing. <laughs> it's, <laughs> right. it, it's sort of a weird thing. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely know of other instructors who have been successful with that. Uh, for example, uh, Kirill Aramenko, who's like another top instructor in the field of data science. He has this uh, super data science conference that he puts on every year. And I'm like, dang, my hat's off to that guy for organizing that. <laughs> That's got to be a ton of work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, it's an opportunity. You know, it's definitely worth doing. And some people, that's what they want to do. Um, for example, um, Jose Portilla, right? You know, I, at least a few years ago, he had a big business doing uh, in-person training. And mm-hmm. if you like doing that stuff, great. You know, Udemy can open the door for that. Um, I just don't like doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I mean, that's why I think a lot of people get into online business and having more of the digital product, passive income type lifestyle is mm-hmm. to have that freedom to kind of call our own shots and work on our own schedule, right? Yeah, it's really hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it, you know. Um, but yeah, that's really the the main thing that changes in your life when you have a successful passive income stream. You know, you you don't have to answer to anyone else. You don't have to be somewhere if you don't want to be. <laughs> and yeah. that gets really addictive really fast. <laughs> well, we appreciate your time on the podcast today. Thank you for uh, giving us a little bit of your time and coming on here and just giving us some great tips. I think we covered a lot of different topics, which is awesome. And we just really appreciate you. And I just hope for continued success on your journey in online education. If people want to find out about you, where can they do that? Yeah, head on over to uh, sundogeducation.com and that's where you'll find uh, how to get a hold of me and uh, where to find my courses. So thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Frank Kane. I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, look forward to talking to you in the future. All right, thanks a lot. All right, take care. That was Frank Kane with Sundog Education. Thanks for joining us today, Frank. You can find out more about him and his business by visiting sundogeducation.com, or you can get the show notes of this episode along with links and resources by visiting onlinecourseigniter.com forward slash three. Come join us next week for an all new episode. Thank you for tuning in to the Online Course Igniter podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening so that you don't miss an episode. If you would like to learn more marketing strategies and how to sell your online course, then also check out our free community where we share tips, tricks, and tutorials at onlinecourseigniter.com forward slash community.